five. And if you are without a Bible, if you'll simply raise your hand up in the air and hold it there for a moment. There's one in the back uh, overflow room. Uh, one of the ushers will get to the, yeah, Eric back there needs one. Anybody else? And one right up here in the front. Okay. And also a welcome to you if you're visiting Calvary Chapel for the first time. Uh, we're going through the book of Ephesians on Sunday morning, and we're currently in the fifth chapter, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 this morning. And uh, if the ushers could get a little bit of air circulating, I think it would be appreciated. So thank you, Doug. Let me read, please, and then we'll pray. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us a well-pleasing aroma to God. Let's pray, please. Father, thank you for your word. It, uh, it is unparalleled in any experience we have in this world. It is alive. It speaks to us. It helps us so much. We ask now, Lord, that you would, through the person of the Holy Spirit, Bless this time in your word. May Jesus Christ be honored and glorified here this morning. In his name we pray, amen. Well, please be seated. I've entitled the message this morning, Imitating God. Imitating God. Let me read those two verses to you again, please. Ephesians 5, 1. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. What Paul does in the fifth chapter is he likens the church to obedient children, to obedient wives, and to obedient husbands. That's, those are basically the three areas that he'll cover as we go through this fifth chapter. And in the fifth chapter, he also gives us God's 12 rules for his household. We are the household of God. He is our father, and he has rules for his household. And we're going to look at just one of them this morning. And God's rules are not, um, you know, they're not a burden to us. Uh, they're the most wonderful thing in the world. The first rule that he gives us is found right here in verses 1 and 2, and it is to imitate God. He says it imitate God. So that's the theme, really, of our message this morning. And I'd like to look at three specific areas of these two verses. First of all, the paragraph. Secondly, the plea. And thirdly, the provision. So starting with the paragraph, the opening words of this paragraph contain two very important words. They are the word imitate and the word therefore. Those two words connect us to what Paul had just said in chapter 4, and they inform us as to what we're to do. If you, uh, you'll notice, of course, as you notice, every book of the Bible has a name. It has chapter 1, chapter 2. Each verse has a number. The translators of the scriptures added those numbers and those divisions to help us navigate through the Bible. It's easier for us to find something in the Bible if we know what page it's on 
and we know what the uh, chapter number is and the verse number. Sometimes the chapter breaks, like from four to five, can be helpful. Sometimes they can be unhelpful. In this case, the linkage between the last two verses of chapter four and the beginning of chapter five is very, very helpful. If you'll look back to chapter four, please, verse 31, Paul, in speaking to the Ephesians, he said, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. In verse 32, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So in those verses, we see the call to holy living, to live our lives set apart to God. He's the one that we're looking to, that we're by faith trusting in day by day. It speaks of kindness. It speaks of love. It speaks of uh, forgiveness. And it shares the same tone as the first two verses in chapter 5. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a well-pleasing aroma to God. So those two words I mentioned, imitate, followed by the word, therefore. The calling by God to us in this chapter is to imitate him, and we'll address that at length in a moment, but I'd like to call your attention to the word therefore. He says, imitate God therefore. The word therefore means in light of everything I've just been saying to you, here is what you are now to do. Whenever you see the word therefore in the Bible, it means now, I've just spoken to you about a number of things, so in light of that, here's the next thing for you to do about what I've just said to you. So it's a very, very important word. We've moved really from the doctrinal portion of the book of Ephesians into the practical application part, or how do we behave? Chapters 1 through 3 explain what God has done for us. He loved us before the world was created. He adopted us before the world was created. He uh, redeemed us. He forgave us. He's manifested his plan to us concerning the world. He's distinguished that there's a specific plan for each one of us. When we believed in him, he sealed us with the Holy Spirit, a mark of ownership and a guarantee of safe passage to God. When we were dead in our sins, he gave us life as a result of his great mercy. He has united us with Christ. He seated us in the heavenlies with Christ. We're in the body of Christ. He's given to us every spiritual blessing that could be given. He's united Jews and Gentiles who can now come to God through Jesus Christ. That line of division is, is over. And he has created us to be a temple for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's the teaching part of Ephesians, the doctrinal part, explaining all of the blessings that God has given to us. Now he's talking in chapter 4, 5, and 6, this is how you are to live. There are bits of wonderful doctrine that pop up, and we're going to look at a couple of them this morning. But we're to be imitators of God. That's what he says. Imitate God, therefore. And so that sets the tone for this section, and that's the first house rule given by God to us as his children in this chapter. So that covers quickly the paragraph. Now, a little further with what I call the plea. Let me read 5.1 again for you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. I want to read it one more time. 
Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. Now, how much of everything does that cover? Huh? Does everything mean everything? Because you are his dear children. So we're called to imitate God. To imitate is to copy the characteristics of another person. Uh, we get the word mimic from the word imitate. Children naturally mimic or imitate their parents, don't they? We've heard the saying, like father, like son. Uh, and how often have we seen a child trying to imitate its mother or father or grandpa or grandma? Now that fact of your children imitating you can be embarrassing or it could be encouraging. How about the little boy who pretends to drive like daddy? or pretends to mow the lawn like daddy, or tries to shave like daddy. I bet you there's not a man here who didn't shave well before you needed to. Uh, I sure tried it out a number of times. I was looking for just one beard hair in my dad's bathroom. Or how about pretending to smoke like dad? Little girls dressing up like mama? Little girls playing with dolls? trying to walk and talk like mom and dad, pretending to have a drink like dad, or using foul language like mom or dad. That concludes our service for the day. <laughs> you know, children learn more by watching and imitating than anything else. And if we are children of God, now this is, of course, speaking to someone who's been born again. A non-Christian can't do this, so don't even try. You need to get saved first. But if we are the children of God, then we, we ought to imitate our Father in everything we do. Remember, he says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do. It's very simple. In verse 2, he says, Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Living a love-filled life is following the example of Christ. Loving one another is basic to the Christian life. Turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 13 for a moment. Romans chapter 13. This is such an interesting verse because I think you'll be surprised at how it explains what it means to love one another. In Romans 13, verse 8, He starts by saying, owe nothing to anyone. Now, he's not saying you shouldn't have a mortgage. He's basically saying, pay your bills. Don't be indebted to somebody. So, owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. We all have obligations with our monthly bills. Um, and we have an obligation given to us by God, and that is to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of the law. Now think about that. You know all of the Ten Commandments and all of the other teachings and admonitions all through the Old Testament? He says in the New King James Version, the entire law is summed up in this one word, love your neighbor. So if we are loving one another, two things will happen. We're not going to disobey God if we're loving one another. And secondly, we're not going to harm one another. When you think of the things in the Ten Commandments, especially starting around the fourth one, which has to do with children obeying their parents 
and being respectful. And then from there, it starts dealing with things like being honest, not, you know, uh, don't tell a lie, don't steal, don't covet, don't covet your neighbor's wife, and so on and so forth. Um, if we're loving one another, we're not going to do those things. We're not going to lie to one another. We're not going to steal from one another. We're not going to try to covet another man's wife, etc., etc. And since God is love, and we, we love to hear that statement, don't we? It's always comforting and encouraging to us. God is love, and since he is, it is logical that God's children will walk in love. And we'll go into that a little more deeply in a few minutes. It's been said that love is the master key to a happy home. You know, we've got a bunch of keys on our key rings here, and unless you have the master key, if you, if you have the master key, you can get into every room in this place. And I'll sell you a copy after the service if you want one. But if you, have the master, if you don't have the master key, you're prevented from getting in. But love is the master key to both a happy home and a happy life. It really is. And loving love or loving one another is the hardest lesson in Christianity. I really think it is. It's the hardest lesson in Christianity. But since it is the hardest lesson, it should be the one we give the most effort to learn about and practice. In fact, it's the, it, it was when a young man came to Jesus and he said, what is the greatest commandment? He was a Jew. They had all kinds of commandments. And G Jesus said, well, the first commandment, the most important one, is to love God, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And he said, and the second one, the guy didn't ask about the second one, but Jesus volunteered it. He said, the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself, or to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's called the, the golden rule. Isn't that a beautiful rule? Do unto others, treat them as you would want to be treated. Somebody has said, you never touch the oceans of God's love as when you begin, as when you forgive and love your enemies. You never even begin to touch the ocean of his love until you start to love and forgive your enemies. Have you had visitors over the last two weeks? <laughs> hmm? Well, first service apparently had more than you did. <laughs> I was thinking just this morning about uh, forgiveness and so on. I, I was reminded, I was, a lot happens when a man's shaving, you know. It's, I guess it's the same. More happens with women because it takes a long time to, well, let me just back out of that completely. <laughs> Enough said. You, you improve your beauty. Let, forget it. But I was shaving this morning, and I was reminded of something somebody did to me one day, and I call it a halfway apology. You know when somebody says, I'm sorry, but then they stick a little knife in your ribs with a slight accusation, or, you know, I'm, I forgive you, or I'm sorry I did that to you, but if you hadn't done that, you know, and I was thinking... That guy, that's what he actually did. He gave what I call a halfway apology. Well, I, and I, while I was thinking of that, it didn't make me happy. I thought, well, that's not right. He shouldn't have done that. And then I thought, just who cares at this point? I forgive that guy for doing that. After I talk to him and take him out back, it's going to be over and done with. <laughs> we'll settle all the, you know, it'll be over. No problems. But... When we talk about forgiving, wouldn't, wouldn't I want someone to forgive me if I had g given a halfway apology? I would, right? And same with you. 
So we're to live a love-filled life. And what Paul does in this section is he gives us three reasons why we are to imitate God by walking in love. The first reason is the Christian is God's child. Look with me to Ephesians chapter 1 for a moment, please. The Christian is God's child. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. This is a beautiful verse. God decided, and I, and I love that word decided. It's mysterious to us. But he decided in advance, you say in advance of what? In advance of creation. He decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us, bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So the Christian is God's child through adoption. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 1, verse 12, the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 12. We're going to do what we used to call when we had phone books. Do you remember phone books? They'd say, let your fingers do the walking. Does anybody remember a phone book, for goodness sakes? Huh? Used to get them piled up on your door. You, good place to rob. Nobody's collected the last five years of phone books. Why am I speaking this way? I don't know. But in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But to all who believed him and accepted him. And there's a big difference between believing and accepting. And the difference is that a person can believe all that they hear about Christ. I would imagine most of you sitting here this morning, you may, be, uh, you may feel a little self-conscious if you're not a Christian. You may feel a little embarrassed of yourself if you're not a Christian uh, as you're listening to the Bible being quoted and listening to a minister speak. But down deep in your heart, I would imagine, having been raised in the United States of America, you have a basic belief about God and a belief about Jesus. But what John is saying here, it's not just believing that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and died for our sins and was buried and rose from the dead, but you have to turn to him and receive him as the only one who can save you. And the reason that he died on the cross for your sins is because you as a unsaved person cannot save yourself. There is nothing you can do to erase your sins, even if you could live perfectly from now till you died, which is impossible. What are you going to do with all of the sins you've mounted up here up until this point? There's no other way for a person to have salvation. You can't go through the window of God's house. You have to come through the door. And Jesus said, I am the door. So you can believe all of that and still be dead in your sins. And you will not go to heaven if you die in your sins. You will go directly to hell if you die in your sins. But if you believe who he is and you accept him, which means I'm accepting that only, I'm accepting that you are God and you have died for me. There's nothing else I can do to save myself. I am a sinner, but you love me and you want me and I, I want you. If you do that, here's what it says. 
God gave the right to become the children of God. Let me read the whole verse. But to all who believed him and, and accepted him. And let me say this while it's on my mind. And I'm not under any misconception about this matter. I've been a Christian for, uh, it's going to be 47 years in February, the 6th of February. And I've been pastoring here for about 2,000 years. No, uh, we're in 41 years. We're going into year 42. But I'm not at all unaware that in a nice congregation, I'm so happy to see uh, new people here today and the, a nice group of people, but I'm certain that not everyone who's here is saved. I'm certain of that. He says, well, how could you know? Well, experience tells you. Going to church doesn't make you any more of a Christian than living in your garage will make you a car. To become a Christian, you have to believe in Christ. And you have to accept him. You have to receive him. And when you do, you become his dear child. The Christian is God's child. Look with me, please, in 1 Peter chapter 1 for a moment. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Here's another scripture which, which talks about the Christian is God's child. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. Uh, again, let me just say, for you have been born again. Now, is everybody that is here, were you born at one time? That's correct, right? You were born. Here you are, right? Right? What happens when you accept Christ, you are born again. But it isn't to a life that will end quickly like your physical life is going to end. Our physical lives are but a vapor. They appear for a little while and then vanish away. Your new life, we're, to we're told, will last forever because it comes from the eternal, the living word of God. Isn't that wonderful? Hmm? Man, oh man. How about 2 Peter chapter 1? There's 1 Peter, and what's after that? There you go. You know, one of the reasons we don't put the verses up on the screens here is because we are, encourage you to become familiar with your Bible yeah, that way, when you want to look up a verse, you kind of remember where it was. You'll remember where it was on the page. Uh, but in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, and we're talking now about the Christian is God's child, he says, and because of his glory and excellence, or his goodness, his grace, his love, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. It enables you to share his divine nature. You are God's child. Now, as God's child, we are not being asked to do something that we cannot or something that is foreign to the Christian life. And the reason is we have received a new nature. The nature that wants to express itself in love. This is God's nature. He didn't just adopt us. I mean, you could adopt somebody and they're, they're adopted, but they didn't come from you. But he not only adopted us, but we came from him. He gave us new life through the word of God. So we've both been adopted and we're family, as much as every other Christian is family. The old nature is basically selfish 
And for that reason, it builds walls, it declares war, but the new nature is loving and therefore builds bridges and proclaims peace. Now remember, we're talking about three reasons why the Christian can live a love-filled life. First of all, the Christian is God's child. You have his nature. God is love, and you can live that way. There's no regeneration or new birth or being born again without spiritual activities. If people say that they're Christians, but if there's no spiritual fruit, it means they've never been born again. They, they may sin, uh, sincerely, with their whole heart, mean it, and they think that they're born again. They think they're Christians, and they're not. So if there is no, there never is true regeneration without spiritual activity showing up. Love doesn't say give me, but rather let me give you. So the Christian is God's child. Secondly, the Christian is God's dear child. Notice in verse 1 of Ephesians 5. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his what? You are his dear children. I saw one of our uh, young mothers this morning for, before first service. I was sitting up here just kind of thinking and praying, and the music was going on. They were practicing, and the mother brought little Oliver in, and they were standing back there, and, uh, and so I was waving at him, and he was looking, and he could hear all the music, and then she brought him up here, and he was so sweet. What a dear little boy. Now, give him about 12 more years, you know, but I mean, uh, uh, this morning, he was a dear little boy, <laughs> but... <laughs> And he was smiling, and then his grandmother came in, and she picked him up. And I was watching them, and I thought, what a dear little child. And how much the mother loves that little child. And how much the grandmother is happy to give him back, you know, at the end of the day. Am I speaking the truth? Huh? You know, people can have children when they're young because they have energy. When you're old, you don't have the energy. By the way, off the script, I've added a fourth fact to tell you when you've become old. Now, some of this is review, but I'm adding a new fact, okay? Number one, when you're old, you rest a lot. Am I telling the truth? Number two, you go to the doctor a lot. Number three, you go to church, right? I've come up with a fourth one. Starting the minute you get up, you start making noises like, oh, oh, mm, oh. And I guess we could add a fifth, you're crooked until you make it into the kitchen. <laughs> Let's get back to the Bible. More pleasant. So the Christian is not only God's child, but you are his dear child. You say, well, that, what does that really mean? Well, it means this. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, and I'll show you what it means. Because it has a wonderful meaning. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. Oh, I guess we could say a seventh is, what did you say? Oh, my goodness. I've given up saying, honey, I'm in the other side of the house. I just let her go on. <laughs> I mean, because I don't want to yell all the way back, honey. Isn't this interesting? Hmm? Okay. So the distinction of being not only God's child, but his dear child, God speaks of us just as he does of his own son, Jesus Christ. Matthew 3, 17, and a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. How about that? He called Jesus my dearly loved son, and he calls us his dear son or his dear daughter. Look to John, the gospel of John, please, chapter 17 in verse 23. By the way, weren't those songs this morning wonderful? Uh, 
They were power packed with good doctrine. Put steel within your soul. In John chapter 17, verse 23, Jesus is praying. And he says a few things here related to us being God's dear child. I am in them, he's in those who follow him, and you, Father, are in me. So you can see the connection. The Father's in the Son, the Son is in us. And then he makes a request. May they, his followers, us, experience such perfect unity, just as he and the Father have, that the world will know that you sent me. And, and here it is, that you love them as much as you love me. Have you ever heard that? Huh? Well, good for you. <laughs> no, I'm saying that. Good for you. I've never really actually realized that. Has anybody else ever really heard that in the Bible? God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Did you ever think that? Come on now. Huh? No, oh, come on. Who would ever think that? But he does. He loves us as much as he loves Jesus. We have been born into a loving relationship with our Father that ought to result in showing our love to God by the way we live. And we could ask this question, what more could our Father do to express his love to us? Is it asking too much for us to walk in love and please him? The third reason that Paul gives is that the Christian is God's purchased child. Not only is the Christian God's child, and the Christian is God's dear child, but God purchased you to become his child. In Ephesians 5, 2, it says, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. He loved us and he offered himself to purchase us. And we're going to develop that just a little bit in a moment. You've heard this before. In John 15, 13, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. That's giving the most you could, right? Somebody's your friend, the most you could give them would be to step in front of that car and push them out of the way or whatever you could do to save them. There's nothing greater that you could do for your friends. But Jesus laid down his life while we were his enemies. Romans 5.8 says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Imagine, what kind of sinners are there in the world? There's murderers, rapists, thieves, warmongers. Conspirators, disloyalty, infidelity. The worst of the worst. And God said, I'm sending my own son to save these people. Now, let me ask you, could you even conceive of ever giving up your own child for just one person in that group? Well, there's one man that says no. I'm assuming the most, the rest of you would agree. How could you? What if you had a little 10-year-old girl? Would you say, well, that murderer can go free, but you can take my 10-year-old girl and execute her? You, couldn't, you could not do it. You just, you could not do it. But that's what God did for you and I. He only had one son, by the way. I mean, if you had 15 kids, you could have picked one that, you know... Just saying. <laughs> Boy, we better get out of here now. There's, there's a lot of doctrine in this 
matter of him offering himself as a sacrifice. And let me just mention these things to you. It first of all speaks of redemption. God redeemed us. Jesus redeemed us by going to the cross. What does it mean to be to redeem something? It means to set someone free from slavery or captivity by purchasing them. In the slave markets, you could purchase a slave and then you could set them free from their enslavement. So when Christ offered himself as a sacrifice, he was a redeeming sacrifice. Jesus Christ is our redeemer. Let me just read a few verses to you. 1 Corinthians 6.20, For God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. 1 Peter 1.18, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now in these last days he has been revealed for your sake. Very quickly, I want to just ever so quickly concentrate on a part of the first verse where he says, for you know that God paid a ransom, here it is, to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. Life without Christ is always an empty life. You don't know that until you've tried this, tried that, gone here, done this, become that, etc., etc., etc. And sin is always pleasurable for a season, but you lose that loving feeling and the thrill is gone. Am I correct or not? Those songs mean something. They weren't written, you know, for uh, kindergartners. <laughs> Would you like me to sing both of those in full length? <laughs> Just a cappella? We can do it together next week. But you know what? If you're not saved, you're an empty person, just like your ancestors who were not saved. You can pretend you're happy, and you can have a modicum of happiness, I suppose, but deep down, you're not satisfied. But if you receive Christ, you now, as you grow in him, he can satisfy you. Jesus said to the woman at the well, he said, listen, uh, if you drink of the water I give you, you'll never be thirsty again. She said, well, you know, since I have to come here every day and get all this water, what kind of water are you talking about? She said, I'd like some of that water. And he went on to speak with her. So the redemption, the benefit of redemption is that sin is paid for and the sinner is released from all consequences of sin and we belong to God. Also, Christ's sacrifice was substitutionary. When he went to the cross, he became our substitute. You know when you have a substitute teacher? It's fun, 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 right? Most of the time. You hope it's going to be fun until the real teacher gets back. Sometimes it's not. But a substitute means not the, the real person. What Christ did is he became our substitute to pay for sins. So when it says he offered himself up as a sacrifice to God. It was both to redeem us and he went there as our sacrifice. How, do, how does a Christian know that their sins are paid for? Because my Savior paid for my sins on the cross. He took my place on the cross. He substituted. I don't have to go to the cross. So we've looked at the three reasons why we should live a 
a love-filled life. We're not only his child, we're not only his dear child, but we're his purchased child. And just to move a little further with this last point, and I've called it the provision, and the, the verse here in verse 2 of Ephesians, Ephesians 5, 2, Paul makes a threefold statement about what Christ has done for us. God's provision becomes a pattern for us to imitate. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, and a, it was a pleasing aroma to God, those three things. Number one, he loved us. The Bible says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. Secondly, he offered himself as a sacrifice for us. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, 39. I'll just say a few things about it while you're arriving, making a landing there. But this is when he had a few of the disciples. He separated the group and took his closer inner circle with him. And he said, just sit here and pray for a while. And uh, he went off and he prayed. And he came back and they were all asleep. <laughs> and he said, couldn't you guys stay awake for just an hour? And they, <laughs> you know. So he said, well, come with me a little bit further. And they went up a little further in the Geth Gethsemane, is the area it was called. And he said, just stay here and pray a little bit, lest you enter into temptation. The flesh is, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he prayed a second time, and he came back, and what were they doing? They were sleeping. And I think he just left it at that point. And he went a little further, and it says in verse 39, and he went a little farther, and he fell on his face. Imagine that. And prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And this is from the New King James, I think. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And the... Greek scholars tell us that between the words me and nevertheless, there was an extensive pause. In other words, Christ made this request of the Father. If it is possible to save man without my going to the cross, could we do that is basically what he was asking. Remember, he was a man. He knew what he was in for. Crucifixion was not something he was unaware of. Crucifixion was the McDonald's and Burger King way of executing people in that time. They were everywhere. Everywhere you'd go, you'd see somebody hanging on a cross. It's how the Roman government put the fear of Rome into you, saying, if you do this, and they'd put their crime up on the cross. So, oh my, he did this, and look what happened to him. So they maintained law and order through crucifixion. Jesus grew up in that world. And he knew as God all of the other things that were going to happen to him prior. And his arrest, his beating, the crown of thorns, and, and the spear in the side, and all of that. But as God, he also knew that on the cross, he was going to be separated from his father. Why is that? Well, because as our substitute for the payment of sin, the wages of sin or what sin pays is death. Death means separation. And Jesus knew that he would be separated from his father and he would die physically. The major separation was from his father with whom he had eternally existed. And Jesus himself was pure. And all of a sudden, he who knew no sin became sin for us. How horrible 
that was to him. And he even cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The disconnect happened. And so it's a mystery of he knew this was decided before creation. He was God. He knew what was going to happen, but he was a man, and it's, it's mysterious. But So when he made the request, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, pause for a while as he waited before his father. And then he changed his mind. He said, nevertheless, apart from what I've just said to you and apart from what I know is going to happen, not as I will, but as you will. So he offered himself as a sacrifice for us. And he was a pleasing aroma to God, we're told in Ephesians chapter 5. The idea behind pleasing aroma is simply that the sacrifice is well-pleasing to God. It's the idea of a satisfying aroma. You know all of the sacrifices that were made in the Old Testament, the Levitical law, different sin offerings, burnt offerings, and so on? There were probably eight or nine types of offerings, and they burned flesh. They burned certain animals and the smell of those animals burning was the same as you smell when you're walking your dog at 5 30 in the afternoon and your neighbor's got a barbecue going and you've never met your neighbor but you think now's the time to meet him <laughs> and say i'm hungry are you <laughs> it's a pleasant smell all those offerings prefigured Christ. Every one of them had a picture of who Jesus was. One would speak of his perfection, his sinlessness, his eternality, his salvation. And so he offered himself as a sacrifice to God, and it was a pleasing aroma to the Father. That indicates the death of Christ satisfies, please listen, the death of Christ satisfies the holy law of God and is therefore acceptable and pleasing to the Father. This is called the atonement or the atoning work of Christ, which means to make amends. You know when people are separated and you say, well, let's make amends? By his atonement on the cross, he blotted out our sins. He gave satisfaction for all of the wrong that had been done. And God was then reconciling to himself we who were alienated from him. And he restored us out of the disrupted relationship we had. The atoning work of Christ. God requires satisfaction for his law because he is holiness. But he makes satisfaction because he is love. People have said God had a problem in saving man. They say, what is that problem? How could God have a problem? Well, does God love people? Huh? Yes or no? Does God love people? Do people have to pay for their sins? Is God just? Yes, he is. Can God just sweep things under the carpet? You know, a little bribe here, a little bribe there, it's all forgotten, we never talked, right? Can God do that? Pardon? He cannot because he's what? He's perfect, he's holy, he's just. So he loved us. We have to pay for our sins. So he said, it's as if he said, wait a minute, I've got it. And a decision was made in eternity past, Jesus, I'm going to send you as a substitute for them. I'll take all of their sins and put them on you. And you'll pay for the, the sins of the world. And then I'll raise you from the dead in righteousness. And then whoever will receive you, 
can become my child because I love every person in the world. So Christ has crossed out the black lines of our sin with the red lines of his own blood. Acts 13, 38, one of the preachers in the book of Acts said, Brothers, listen, we are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. So we can imitate Christ in these three ways that we just mentioned. We can love one another. Now, when I say we can, I'm talking about actually doing it, not just, you know, it's always nice to talk about love and all of that kind of stuff, but it's hard to love one another sometimes. But we can love one another just as he loved us. In fact, in John 13, 35, Jesus said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The world doesn't act like this. They don't play like that, do they? They don't. Did Jesus offer up his body? Turn with me to Romans chapter 12 for a moment, please. So we can love one another just as Jesus loved us. That's imitating God. And we can offer up our bodies to God, not in the same way Jesus did at the cross, but we can offer up our bodies to God each day just as he offered himself up to God on the cross. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And so, and the words and so are after 11 chapters where Paul taught the doctrine of justification by faith, starting in really Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Took him 11 chapters to lay out the most wonderful thing that can happen to a human being, and that is that God can justify them. And so he's saying, in light of everything I've just taught you, in those 11 chapters, if we were in the New King James, it would be that word therefore again. But he says, and so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you. And may I say, he doesn't say I command you. Now you can be saved and do this, or you can be saved and not do this. And if you're saved and you don't do this, there still is no condemnation in your life from God. However, you will be a miserable Christian you'll go spiraling down. But if you follow what he's pleading for, you will experience the kind of life that God has for you. You'll become a growing Christian. He says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Just say, here I am. I belong to you. You purchased me. I'm really not my own. I belong to you, but consciously I want to submit and surrender my will to you. Let them, your bodies, let them be a living and a holy sacrifice or a pure sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So we can do that, can't we? Hmm? Now, I also know that not only, you know, are there people here this morning that I pray you'll come to Christ before you leave the service. If you know that God has been working in your life, now is the day of salvation. There's no point in waiting. If God has been revealing things to you about yourself, your sin, and how hopeless you are, and that you're without God, and that he loves you, and he'll save you, I urge you to call upon the name of the Lord. So we can love one another, we can offer our bodies, to, but let me back up. I, I also know that for all of us here, and I'll put myself in, we're all here together, we can hear this and understand it, 
and believe it and know that it's true and it's right, and I'm talking about Romans 12:1 of the consecration of our lives, but we could leave here today and not do it. Am I right or not? And if we are hearers only and not doers, we deceive ourselves. We're like a person who gets up in the morning, you look in the mirror to kind of fix yourself after a night's sleep, and the mirror shows you who you are. God's word is showing us who we are. But if we just hear it and see what we are, but we don't adjust ourselves, then we go our way and we forget what God showed us. And the devil will come right along behind you and he'll take advantage of your unwillingness to surrender and consecrate your life to God. He can't pull you out of God's kingdom, but he can sure attack you. Are you stronger when you're consecrated to God or are you stronger when you're going your own way? Huh? Pretty easy to figure out, right? Are you going your own way today? Or there's no neutrality here, by the way. You can't say, well, I'm not really into this, but I'm not really against it. Oh, no, no. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. So Paul was pleading. And the, the third thing is, and we'll close with this, uh, and something that Pastor Chuck Swindoll, he called me last evening and gave me something. I want to share that with you in a minute. No, he didn't, but I just, <laughs> just wanted to see how uh, there was silence out there. He knows Chuck Swindoll? I do. And he was in the Marine Corps as well, so he's up there. Matthew 6.10 says, May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, when we ask for God's will to be done, how do we think about it? Don't we think about it like, should I do this? Should I do that? Is this going to happen? Is the door closed? Is it open? We think in those kinds of non-abstract ways, wouldn't you say? But the, the literal meaning of the word or the concept of God's will is what is pleasing to you? So you could actually say, Father, what is your will regarding this matter? Or you could just as well say, Father, what is most pleasing to you about this question I have? I want to please you. I just don't quite know what to do, but I want to please you. Would you please show me? So you can be pleasing to God. And it is a sweet aroma. You are a sweet aroma to him. I mean, think of the times when your children have been of such a mind to want to please their mom and dad. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's truly pleasing to you. And it's not pleasing when they're stubborn and so on. They usually do it about once in their life. That went this way, and then I think it took a sharp left, <laughs> went out the back door. But listen, here is what Pastor Chuck Swindoll said about this whole matter. As believers, our Father is God. If we are in contact with him throughout life's circumstances and we look to his guidance and authority in our lives, it stands to reason that we will reflect his characteristics. He is kind, so let's be kind. He is just, so let's be just and fair. He is holy, so let's be pure. He is full of grace. So let's demonstrate and live out grace. He is righteous. So let's live in righteousness. The list goes on and on and on. And if we have any question about how to do this, live this way, Christ, the perfect son of God, 
has lived out the example before us. I think that statement years ago, what would Jesus do, was a good one. You don't like to hear it when, <laughs> you know, you're not doing what Jesus would do. But what would he do? How would he do it? Why would he do it? When would he do it? We can do that in our own lives. He said, be imitators of him. Father, thank you so much for our time together this morning.